Today we are looking at a struggle, a battle if you will, between the executive and the judiciary. How clear are the separation of powers and what happens when you have a conflict between one branch of government and another? We have the New Zealand Superannuation Act, 1974. What this established was a compulsory retirement scheme. The employees would contribute a portion of their salary, and then the employers would have to match that amount. And this was going to a collective retirement fund. Now, this was, the superannuation scheme was enacted by labor, and it was opposed by national. And National promises to abolish the scheme if National comes to power. National eventually wins the election. The same day that National won the election, the superannuation board received a letter from the Prime Minister, and in this letter was a draft press release announcing that National intended to abolish the superannuation scheme and refund all contributions. Three days later, Muldoon announces to the public the impending termination of the program, and he tells New Zealanders that they would not be prosecuted if they ceased making contributions to the scheme. Ergo, they can stop as of today. So the question before us today is, did Muldoon repeal the law properly? The main issue is that we have a law in place that requires contributions to a retirement scheme. What we also have is a prime minister, head of the government, informing us that we no longer have a duty to make those contributions. <coughs> Ergo, that we can break the law and that we will suffer no legal consequences if we do. Now we also have to keep in mind, we have a first-past-the-post system. So national is the government. Whatever policy national wants to push forward is going to go through. So we know for certain that the superannuation scheme is going to be abolished. Did Muldoon repeal the law properly? Or did Muldoon violate Section 1, Bill of Rights, 1688, that sets out the separation of powers. Now, Bill of Rights, 1688, Section 1, makes very clear that the Parliament is the supreme lawmaking authority, not the executive, and not the judiciary, Parliament. Then we have Mr. Fitzgerald, and he files a civil suit against the Prime Minister to have his press release declared illegal and requesting an injunction against the Prime Minister to get him to restart collecting contributions for the superannuation <coughs> scheme. The court looks specifically at Bill of Rights 1688. So the issue before us is whether or not the PM's <laughs> actions were a violation of Bill of Rights, 1688. Now, Section 1 states very clearly that the suspension of any law by legal authority is illegal. So did the Prime Minister's announcement constitute an act of legal authority? According to the court, yes, it did. So Fitzgerald won on the merits of the case. Prime Minister's actions? are in breach of Section 1, Bill of Rights, 1688. What did Fitzgerald want? He wanted the announcement made by the Prime Minister declared illegal, and he got that. What did he also want? He wanted some form of compensation. He wanted the contributions to recommence. Now think of the date. Parliament is about to reconvene. According to Chief Justice Wilde, it would be an altogether unwarranted step to require the machinery of the New Zealand Superannuation Act now to be set in motion again, when the high probabilities are that all would have to be undone again within a few months. The 
court declared the prime minister's actions improper, illegal, well, what they did was adjourn all other matters for six months. What the court was trying to do with this ruling is make clear that the separation of powers is sacred. You reaffirmed, if you will, <coughs> the separation of powers and that nobody, not even the prime minister, is above the law. And nobody except for parliament can change the law. The final topic that I want you to consider today is emergency <coughs> powers. Think of this in terms of wiretapping, searches, assassinations, everything that you've been reading about in the news. Now, in many of these instances, these actions are being engaged in at the discretion of the executive without getting approval from Parliament. Are these actions justified? What we have to understand is that whether it be wiretapping, whether it be torture, whether it be detention, even if there is a justification, and what is the justification that we use these days? Terrorism. National security, terrorism, these kind of things. <coughs> what we have to understand is that all of these are violations of the law. Because the law clearly says that one is due their privacy, one is allowed to preserve their bodily integrity, there go, no torture, one is allowed to own property, that means that someone cannot search your home, your car, your person, without a warrant, something we'll look to later. But in these instances, we see this actually happening. And we're not passing laws that are saying that these can happen. What we're doing is simply ignoring the law that is in place. And there's a justification for it. There's a reason for it, national security. But at the end of the day, these are still violations of the law. What is troublesome about that? Is it a real emergency? Who makes the decision? How far do we go? It's not treating everyone equally. It's not treating anyone, everyone equally. Can we think of racial profiling? So we're categorizing, targeting people based on their ethnic background. Now it's different for us as individuals to do it, because we can be bigots. Now that's different when the state engages in it because of the rule of law and the requirement to treat everyone the same. Now I'm raising this issue for you to think about it because this is going to relate to everything that we're going to examine in part D concerning rights. <laughs>